A question to ask yourself, so okay, so, the, so, so far, I've talked a lot about money and, the, and what it's like and where people are at with it and stuff like that, but I've only really given you two action items. One is look at your P&L on a monthly basis, and the second is have a goal for liquidity in your personal life and your business life. Two pretty simple things, but if you're not doing them, you're not gonna get the benefit of them. It's like an exercise program or a diet, right? Another question to ask yourself is what recurring expenses, expenses do we have? And you look at that on a quarterly basis. Every three months, what recurring expenses do we have? If Zipify is on that list, you keep it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If you don't need it, it's okay. Um, no, but you, you might have like Wistia and Zendesk and Dropbox and Shopify and some random thing you haven't used in six years that you're still paying for. Everyone in here has one of those. I know Zach has been hitting me up for a year, being like, dude, we gotta, re we gotta review these recurring expenses. I know that we're not using half of this stuff. So it's really important to look at that because every dollar counts, right? Because let's say there's 200 bucks a month in recurring expenses that you're no longer using. Well, that is $2,400 a year that could be being used for another part of your business. It's energy that is being siphoned off for no reason. And like, we're in the optimization business. You stop optimizing, you stop looking, you let too many little, it's, it's, a, it's a systemic issue. If you are not looking at your recurring expenses, guess what, you're probably not looking at a whole bunch of other stuff that's piling up. So you have to do every little thing. You gotta look at this stuff, even though you're like, ah, it's only 200 bucks, I'll look at it next month. No, save that $200. $200 is worth a lot. I remember when um, I was working at this makeup shop before we had the wig business. I, I took a job at this makeup shop um, because I was, I was getting out of the life of being a poker player. I was going straight, you know what I mean? Uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna be on the up and up. I wasn't gonna be in the underground poker scene. I was gonna take a job at this makeup shop. I was gonna go to yoga and try to meet girls, you know what I mean? I was out there doing it. And, um, and this lady who owned this makeup shop, first she had a manager and I convinced her that the manager was terrible and I would be a better manager. So she fired that manager and put me in, which was great. Uh, and the manager was terrible, first of all. all right? He was just chilling, I wasn't doing anything. This guy, Ralph, get out of here, Ralph. I love Ralph Burns if he's in here, but this guy was a terrible, terrible manager and his name was Ralph. And I was like, look, I could do a better job at this. I'll be out there selling. The yoga studio was next door, but anyways, what I'm getting at is she was, this was a special effects makeup shop on the Lower East Side of New York City. It was no bigger than, ha it was as big as this half of the state. It was this, this deep, literally this deep. You could see it from the street, you can still see it to this day. It's a coffee shop on uh, Allen Street, New York City. It's not deep at all, brick wall, and a bunch of glass windows. And it was special effects. Now, anyone seen Face Off on FX, the show Face Off? That's all about special effects makeup, how to make monsters for movies. She was doing this back before it was popular, and I got a job, and I accidentally, you know, super glued eyebrows onto someone. I did some bad stuff in there. You're not supposed to use super glue on the eyebrows, it turns out. But uh, I was in there selling makeup, doing my thing, and she also sold wigs that she got from these Jewish dudes in Midtown. These, you go into this crazy Midtown loft, and you got this Jewish guy, and he's uh, got the Penises and everything, and he's just sitting there, just banging down apple pies and selling wigs. And uh, he had these little apple pies. These little, he had this, he had this giant bag of miniature apple pies, and he's just, bang, just at one a minute. I'm not even kidding. It was just like he's a, he was a big gentleman, and and he was just scarfing these things down and slanging wigs. But he, um, he was great. I love that guy. But anyways, she sold. 15 Elvis wigs one day, and I was packing up, and it was $150 for this order, and I was like, man, if I ever sold 15 Elvis wigs and made $150, I will have made it. That was it, that was a lot of money. That was like a week's paycheck or something, maybe more. So point is like, no money is, you know, like you gotta respect the money, and you have to feng shui it, to use the parlance of our time, where like, if you don't build a stable foundation for it, and you're not looking at it, it has nowhere to grow. It's just gonna leave. So you've gotta like create a space and a container to hold money and that's one of the reasons why it's actually better to make money incrementally 
than to make a whole bunch at once because your, ability, your capacity to handle money is like your capacity for anything else. You can't go in and bench press 300 pounds day one. You don't have the capacity. But if you work at it for a year, eventually you will have that capacity. So your capacity to have grows in any given endeavor with as much attention as you put on it, right? Your capacity for intimacy and connection and self-reflection, like John O'Connor was talking about, grows to the degree that you pay attention to it. Money's the same way. And I feel really fortunate that Carrie and I made a bunch of money and blew it, and then made money incrementally so that we understood how to handle it incrementally. So point is, um, you got you to pay attention to it. So what recurring expenses do you have? Are you pulling money for taxes? Zach, how much do you pull out for taxes? Is it like 30%, 10%, something like that? You just pull it to the side, put it for taxes, right? Something like that? Okay. Zach's a bit of a shy guy, so if you try to talk to him, um, <laughs> he, he gave a nod. For those of you who didn't see, it was a yes. Um, <laughs> so we pull money aside for taxes, and we pay our quarterly taxes. If you're not paying quarterlies, you're going to get in trouble. Will they penalize you now if you don't pay quarterlies? They'll just get, make you, they'll penalize you, right? So you have to pay them. And uh, you know who gets their money? The IRS gets their money. Don't try to not pay the IRS. They're going to get it one way or another. And yeah, there's some stuff you can do, right? You write off your expenses, whatever they are. You be smart about reinvesting capital. You do all the stuff you can do that's above the board, which a, fin a good financial strategist can help you with. But at the end of the day, you pay the taxes because it's very, and some people try to do it overseas and all kinds of stuff, and my experience with people with big money is the complexities of trying to avoid the IRS are miserable, not much fun, and don't save you any more money than you would have made if you had just spent that energy on your business. So do it well and be smart about it and get solid financial uh, advice. And this is another thing that I learned, very hard lesson for Carrie and I, very, very hard lesson. If you are your accountant's biggest client, fire them. Ask them the normal range of their clients before you sign up. And if you're the biggest one, do not go there. Because the management of money and taxes and the strategy within is dictated by the volume. That is not a, um, that is not a what's the word here? It's not a, like a nefarious thing. It's just a description because the tax laws differ based on the amount of money you have. This is just the way the laws are written, is where you fall in this range dictates what your strategy should be. And if you have a strategy that's being dictated by someone who does not understand the range you're in, you're screwed. I've been there, it's tough, you don't want it. Make sure that you have someone who understands your tax bracket, your income level, who works with people of your size. And if you are struggling in that area, I have great recommendations. Hit me up in a PM in Facebook, I'll holler at you. Um, money is a lot like farming, right? You invest it, you water it, and then you harvest it, and you use it. And some people forget the first part, and these are the people who are just balling out all crazy. They don't take their money and put it back into the thing that, they don't take their money and put it into the thing that got them into the dance in the first place, and they lose it all. Happens more. This part happens more. The people who forget to plant. They forget to take the money, that their business is making and reinvest it back in the operation. My viewpoint is that 50% of profit should be reinvested back into the operation at a minimum. 50% of profit back in, if you can. Maybe you've got to live on some of it, maybe you don't. And then you've got the people who forget to harvest, which were the people on this side of the stage, who are all crazy tight and they're worried about it, and oh, where's that? Got to harvest it sometimes, you got to enjoy it. You have to do both. And if you can get a balance there, you'll be able to manage your money in the long term. So um, that was the talk that I wanted to give on money because I feel like those are the most common places I see people kind of getting hic hiccups in relationship to um, their money. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that.